Well, it's exciting to see so many people interested in James Castle. It's <laughs> obviously uh, not a secret society anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, now, just, just to tell you what's going to happen, uh, these images are going to stay up for about a minute each, and they will change. So you, if you get bored with us, you have something to look at. <laughs> This is a very informal conversation. I promised all my distinguished colleagues that they did not have to prepare anything, uh, only to bring their richly furnished minds and their thoughts about James Castle and other self-taught artists. So I'm going to ask all of you, because um, I know all of you started, well, not you have had many, many lives, as far as I know. Um, all of you started out in other fields and interested in other things. So uh, what I want to know is um, when did you uh, and how did you become interested in the set work of self-taught artists? And me? <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, Philadelphia Museum uh, began to collect self-taught um, work by self-taught artists in the early 90s partly because there were so many collections in Philadelphia of this material, partly because there was a really good gallery, Fleischer Ullman Gallery, that had gotten interested in it um, in the beginning. And we um, got a gift, a major gift, from Joseph Navarelli of a fabulous Martin Ramirez um, train, great big drawing, and that kicked it off. And it seemed to job with their sort of Duchampian and, and um, our very contemporary um, eth ethos that the Philadelphia Museum is known by. And once that one gift came in, many other gifts came in behind it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I was the drawing curator. There were mostly works on paper, and I became de facto the outsider person. David? I guess um, from, the, from the European perspective, studying art history in graduate school and knowing the text by Prince Horn and obviously the work that Dubuffet would think about the art of the disabled or the insane as he would call it, really kind of influenced the way that I would think about looking at that within the American context. And um, when I was in Houston at the Menil Collection, again, it was a um, very interesting um, gift that propelled some of my own interest in work in the art art of um, outsiders or self-taught artists, um, but also kind of the, that really unique collection there where it was um, a, a real element of the collection that even if it was um, <clears throat> an artist like Rothko or it was a Byzantine um, fresco, the, the idea that art had to communicate something that went beyond the proper name. Um, so I think it was in some ways influenced by that way of thinking about um, what art can do, obviously when endowed with the capacity to think about the individual maker, but then what it does to, to an audience. Did the um, surreal part of the Demille things feed into that? It did, but they were also very involved in supporting um, art made by prisoners in the Texan penal system. And also some, I mean, some things that would come into the collection, like a Wolf Lee, then a Martin Ramirez that would mm -hmm. come in in drips and drabs. And then um, the Whitney just um, made a major acquisition of James Castle's work. Mm -hmm. And part of our reinstallation of the permanent collection has really been to think about, you know, things that many of the people in this room has been working on, which is, you know, the real interface between the so-called outsider and more mainstream mm -hmm. narratives about modernism. So the castle is in the castle group of works, which is about 20 and on display for the last year or so in rotation, is in the same room as Charles Sheeler's photograph of the Orangeburg's apartment or Edward Hopper's uh, paintings of different homes and interiors. Mm -hmm. So how can these artists be thought of t together? That, that's something I hope we'll talk about in more uh, depth, the, the new thinking about no longer separating these artists from the mainstream. But Philip, I'm still curious how you got into this. <laughs> well, not dissimilarly, I think uh, for my 15th birthday, I asked my mom if she would drive me to meet Howard Finster at his Paradise Gardens, uh, and she did. And I went down there and I met Preacher Finster, and that was sort of interesting, and I bought my first thing. 
uh, with some you know allowance money basically <laughs> and um, yeah I started collecting in the in the field I guess at, at that age and I would uh, invite my friends over from high school to see all these things by like the Atkins from rural Kentucky or quilts mm -hmm. or things that I sort of hung around my room and I remember being really interested I had no formal education in the arts and sort of still don't but um, <laughs> I was really interested in, in James Castle because the first time I saw that work, I must have been 18 or so, mm -hmm. and I realized that he was drawing these installations, uh, you know, that he was doing inside barns or other buildings on his property, not so dissimilarly from what I was doing in my high school uh, bedroom, albeit with uh, objects from other things I'd collected in and around, uh, mostly the rural south. And that sort of led to this, um, what has now become a lifelong uh, real obsession with this field, particularly things made uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line. And in that capacity, I worked with people like Thornton Dial, Lonnie Hawley, all the quilt makers of G's Bend. And those have really been, uh, over the years, my teachers. Um, you know, I really had uh, incredible and unfettered access to these, uh, who I consider to be some of the most talented artists of the 20th century. Um, but I don't really come at it from the perspective of uh, art history, the canon, and those kinds of things. I don't really have that sort of education. So... Um, so well, we've got we've got the full spectrum yeah. here. There you go. So my, and my next question is: When did you first encounter Castle, or how, if you can remember? <laughs> oh well, John oh, Ullman had um, uh, Castle shows um, in the Fleischer Ullman Gallery in Philadelphia, and I went to them and actually bought one or so um, in the nineties in the in the early 90s, I think. The Fleischer Ullman Gallery was very remarkable because Janet Fleischer, who started it, had this pan um, world view. She had contemporary art, she had um, ethnic and Af African and oceanic, she had um, outsider. It, it was a vanguard position in the, in the 70s, um, in the 60s and 70s for a gallery, at least in Philadelphia. My first encounter with, with Castle was at a gallery in New York, and it must have been the early early 90s as well. And that was um, when Nodler Gallery was still in existence. Um, there was a show of the uh, interiors and barnyards. I knew nothing about Castle. I knew something about several other self-taught artists, but I had never encountered him before. I didn't know his history. I just was bowled over by these works. And uh, that's when I started finding out about it. What about you guys? Yeah, well, I think it must have been at the Outsider Art Fair where I originally saw them at the Puck Building. And mm -hmm. it might have been in the booth of Phyllis Kind, or it might have been, I mean, I don't remember particularly, but I, I, I remember seeing them and then coming back to them over and over again over the, over the years. There was a kind of gap between the exhibitions that uh, were organized in the last years of <laughs> Castle's life and then his re-emergence in the Outsider Art Fair. Mm -hmm. yeah, and mine was seen in a, a collector's home whose collection is very diverse, like you were talking about, Anne, but um, really with a specific uh, emphasis on um, conceptual photography. Uh -huh. And I think it came into that collection because one of the artists recommended or you know, mm -hmm. introduced the work um, to her. And so it was interesting to think about then, again, that relationship between artists that I knew and was thinking about who had discovered or who knew Castle's work and had been thinking about it in dialogue with her own, like Zoe Leonard, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so to see those generations of different artists finding um, Castle at different times and then thinking about the relationship with that practice. Well, of course, the artists have pretty much led the way mm -hmm. in paying attention to self-taught artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dubuffet and Art Brut for starters and the and Martin Ramirez was discovered by or, Jim Nutt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what um, artists collect castle now? I think we could ask people to raise their hands here, possibly. <laughs> 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 so I have one. <laughs> but it's um, that would be a very interesting question to answer, because I, I think he does speak very directly. Um, to, but it's, it's interesting that he, he's speaking to people who are interested in photography. Mm -hmm. Mm 
one wouldn't necessarily expect. Well, and I, I found it interesting in the show that you did, which is fantastic. Uh, congratulations Thank you. on that. Well, that's um, because of the generosity of both the William Louis Dreyfus Foundation and the James Castle Collection, mm -hmm. uh, both of whom were just incredible. And it wouldn't happen without them. Of course, I was thinking about the, the richness of what he could do in drawing, but I, when thinking about what photographers get from him, there's that amazing one that you included, which is done on the back of uh, the ice cream mm -hmm. um, carton label. Yeah. And it's a depiction of what's on the other side. Yeah. And it it's really made real me... semi dream. Incredible. And, well, and then the relationship to photography and, and those issues. But also this idea that what happens if you could see two things at once? What if you could be inside and outside at the same time? Which I think is always what or frequently what a photographer is thinking about doing. And you can see that at work in the specifically in the selection that you well, put there's, together. Well, there's so many of the box top castle, the castles, which are, um, I mean, if I were more adept at this thing, I could find one, but there, it's gonna, another one's gonna come up at some point. Um, and often there'll be the exterior of the farmyard on one side and an interior on the other side. Um, but the, but the, I mean, Castle's relation to photography is, is often very direct. There are those books that look like imitation photo albums. Yes. I mean, some of them have the zigzag borders of the, of the old-fashioned prints. Uh, it's, and so much of his world was, or, or his visual world, was the, the, the substitute for art was uh, advertising and magazine photographs. I wonder about things like the uh, Sears Robot catalog. Mm -hmm. you know, some enterprising graduate students should be leafing through, <laughs> finding the sources. Has anyone done that, Ed? Not that I know of. It would be kind of huge because <laughs> the, um, it's clear that he took just enormous amounts of his imagery from um, uh, mailer, pop, popular um, mailed material um, uh, catalogs, magazines, um, uh, wrappers, um, product packaging, um, logos, and used it um, in, um, uh, in, in not just copied it, but he would take um, a logo and arrange it, arrange multiple images of it in a kaleidoscopic circular fashion that was... That, that's one thing we sound. don't have in the show. There are the yeah. circular... There's a whole lot of things. We don't have that don't <laughs> The thing about Castle is the more you work on him, the more you realize that there is so much different stuff there that's conceptual and that he was um, exploring and getting into it. It has to do with text art and, and um, although he didn't read, we assume, and he didn't speak and we assume he didn't understand spoken or written language. I mean, we kind of know that from his family. But um, if you, um, and I only scratched the surface working on it, I just got a little, a little ways. Um, but there are all these um, strategies and um, categories of making art that he goes through from surrealism to abstraction mm -hmm. to patterning to work text art to, um, uh, God on and on. I can never remember them all. And anybody tackling the work as a whole has got a big job. There's plenty of room for dissertations all over the place. <laughs> uh, the books are so mysterious. Mm -hmm. And beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And collage. He's a beautiful use of collage, especially in his books. I may be able to advance this, but I wouldn't count on it. It, it will, it, well, it's advancing itself, so I don't have to. But, you know, so many of these images look familiar, and uh, maybe because they, they're based on uh, kind of images we know, but they're, they're uh, and then the, the text that becomes this abstract squiggle. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the people who wrote about this said that it reminded him of yearbooks. And I, I got a phone call asking, uh, do you know if James Castle saw his siblings yearbooks? And I, I was afraid that I had absolutely no knowledge of this, and I did not know what high schools in Boise were producing in the time that 
Castle's siblings would have had them. Well, the, uh, the Gooding School for the Deaf that he went to for five years in the teens, um, they made their own books. Well, isn't that and where so, he, it's believed he learned how to make well, the It's possible. Yeah. I mean, who knows? And mm -hmm. so um, he would have come along as a um, 11, 12 teenager, early teenager, mm -hmm. with, uh, with some background in making books from the deaf school. Now, I am going to stop this here, if I can. Um, because what do you make of these? I find these utterly, utterly mysterious. I understand some of these um, rather strange letters had to do with the teaching of uh, deaf speech. Well, the actually, the, and they had something called vowel charts, which were kind of things they hung up like a window shade, and they had paired um, regular Arabic um, alphabet vowels on them, like E, I, O, U, and um, things like that. They, taught, they used that as a teaching tool in the deaf school. Um, but somehow he seems to have gotten into a, a, either a Cyrillic alphabet or a modified Cyrillic alphabet. Um, and I don't know exactly how that works at all. Um, but I th obviously he was interested in the shapes of letters. Mm -hmm. I would think he was certainly so. interested in books, in the meaning of books, in the meaning of language, in the meaning of words, without, we assume, ever having heard them and without knowing what they meant. Very hard to figure out. <laughs> I would, so there are in calendar as well. In calendars, the yeah. calendar shapes. Because they're based on calendar calendars. Here, you think, uh, they're based on I guess, calendars. I guess these oh. are. Because they have a lot of calendars from the family and the oh. family stuff. Uh, one thing that I found interesting, I wonder if the, the two of you who have worked on shows of Castle's work could talk about is the way that he would arrange his own work yeah. for people to see them or for him to then draw kind of these these composites you of mean in the work. kind of um, installation yeah, and things. yeah. And yeah. literally in the sheds and what they'll come up in these there songs. was a, there was yeah. an image and uh, because he was he was really aware of himself as an artist mm -hmm. which is odd I mean I don't know if he had the word for artist but he would show people the work he'd done and he'd be um, this is all from family recollections and I don't think it's perfectly true um, if people didn't respond to it he would be offended and he wouldn't <laughs> show them again and and he, in secret he took he they lived on a farm there were outbuildings who weren't used they were kind of ratty and kind of um, um, shabby and he would line up his constructions and his books on the floor and his drawings on the wall and he'd make his own installations in the in an unused farm structure space and then draw it um, which is what it is what it is I guess. Yeah. but he certainly thought of himself as an artist uh, there is an image and I hope it will come up again or perhaps we could get some help in finding it again uh, which has Two of his installations, the, the, the thing in the little images um, that you sent made, me in the yeah. little box thing, and, yeah. and that drawing on the left yeah. is one of the key um, word drawings. Because that is a real play on words. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how does somebody who does not know words yeah. make place, make lace into place? That's in the National Gallery right now. Yeah, in the um, in and the, the one on the right is down. Some. The one on the right is downstairs. Yeah. Um, so what, what do I do to go back? I want to go backward. Backward. I just keep doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And to this, to this issue of um, his awareness of being an artist, if not having, you know, the word or language for it, was there anything in that you discovered of the archives or materials that showed him, you know, with um, with ephemera depicting an artist at work, like not uh, not just a cartoon of people working, but popular culture depictions of the artist as a, as a figure. Was that I don't a, know. He copied a lot of cartoons and he copied yeah. political cartoons. But I don't remember an artist at work, but his family, his four um, nieces, I mean four nieces, three nieces and nephew lived with him for most of their younger lives. And they were very clear in their recollections. And he didn't like to be watched at work. Mm -hmm. And if the 
the little kid snuck up and watched him while he was drawing to get mad. He apparently worked very fast. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, dipping the um, pointed stick and the soot and the spit and stuff. And then he had his, some point his own little host to work in. But um, the, um, I don't remember mm -hmm. um, a kind of, uh, any kind of copying of something or depiction of an artist at work. He was more into bundling the things and storing, mm -hmm. as Lynn Cook brought out very clearly in her Ray and the Sophia show mm -hmm. in Madrid, um, in saving them and making sure they were preserved and protected and bundling like things together in these little homemade bundles, which are really kind of wonderful looking. And, um, and in um, showing them to people and in privately displaying them like that. Well, there, there in are sheds. quite a few. And, Quite a few images yeah. like this, and they were they were private things. They were not. Um, and then he had a show. He had two, several shows when he was still alive in the um, 50s and the 60s. He died in 77, um, and he went to at least one opening. One in Boise. He went maybe one in Salt Lake City, and so he saw his work, and he mm -hmm. apparently fussed around with the arrangement of the. Of, of the installation, so he got the picture mm -hmm. of, uh, of what it was to be an artist mm -hmm. there, in a way. And there are quite a few of these, and I'm hoping this will start moving again. Um, I was trying to advance it, and it won't advance. I did that, okay. Well, oh, there we go. Needs it, it needs its master. Um, <laughs> you want to sit up here? <laughs> Um, there's another one where it's a, a group of people, oh, I guess it's with the people. Um, because there's, there are ones that seem to have, install, they're installations of his figures or maybe they're real people. You can't you really know. tell. You never can yeah. tell. But they're probably yeah. um, constructions yeah. of people. Probably. Well, that's certainly what they look like. But before we leave the word pieces, I mean, purse discusses? I mean, <laughs> he does it over and over yeah. and over again, and it's kind of beautiful and yeah. sort of poetic. And and I, it's the I think it is truly true that he did not hear um, that uh, people who say he was mute, he was not mute. He could make noises, but he his family says if you ran up behind him and clapped and jumped up and down, made noise, he did not hear. So he presumably never heard the sound of those words. But he does these rather poetic combinations of words, and um, just a whole lot of work with words. I mean, like you put him up with text artists mm. today. You know? What what yeah. so what I find very intriguing is there'll be, there are many many things like this, what, like the the one the word piece we were just looking at, and you say or the or lace or plays. And you can say, well, it's the shape of the letters that he's interested in. But then the political cartoons that he copied, which often have balloons with text, he just blanked that out. You know, just did stripes. Which he usually does, anyway, yeah. with, the, um, with text yeah. that he didn't write. You know, yeah. In the I, mean, I find the, the more time I spend with Castle, the more of an enigma he becomes. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, and that's just a copy. That's a copy. Photograph. Well, they, 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 we have three versions of this downstairs, and um, Jackie Christ was kind enough to send us the original image, or a facsimile of the original image. And uh, when you, when this moves, you will see. They're beautiful. That they're beautiful, and they're not exact copies. Each mm -hmm. one is a, something different happens spatially. But why does he want to copy that? <laughs> or, or the honey, yeah. uh, or the, the you know, it's as though it's all, well, it's, it's high-low, mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not discriminating. But also just formally, the, that interest in the column that recurs through mm -hmm. much of the work. That mm -hmm. You mean the totem The totem thing, yeah. thing, you know, I could see the appeal of seeing something that exists outside of his everyday, mm -hmm. or at least in the everyday in the landscape, not the everyday of the print material mm -hmm. or the popular culture that he sees and seeing something that maybe he had created in a place that was then emulated mm -hmm. elsewhere. It's this kind of and Nobody back and can forth. figure yeah. out why, why, though, these kind of 
Um, sometimes they look like they're made out of um, a cut out of a, um, of a um, clapboard wall. Mm -hmm. They've got clapboards. And sometimes they're solid. And nobody knows why these abstracted um, totemic images appear in a farm landscape. Yeah. I mean, yeah. nobody yeah. knows that. Yeah. I mean, this, this gives you a good idea of just how inventive he was being. I mean, he's not being literal about this at all. But that's, I hadn't thought about those lampposts in relation to the totems. That's, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Uh, I, I want to sort of go back to the idea of, um, you know, these, um, these artists not necessarily knowing or understanding or acknowledging that they are indeed artists. And in my experience, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people who probably did not conceive of themselves as artists in the way that maybe, you know, somebody who went to a, a traditional art school would. But I've actually never met somebody, including people that are blind and deaf, people that have various disabilities or Down syndrome, uh, any, any kind of thing. Uh, they've always um, sort of behaved like artists not only in the creation of their work, but in the, the reception of their work. So I worked with a gentleman from rural Kentucky who was indeed blind and deaf. When he was a kid, he would sew uh, bags that would come in the mail, you know, bread bags, not unlike Castle using things uh, with the flour sacks, et cetera, but he would sew them the length of the floor together and most likely his, his mother or one of his sisters taught him how to sew and then, you know, the mother would throw them away and then he would sew them and then she would throw them away and then he would hang them all over the house. And there are very few pictures, but when I knew him, he passed away not so long ago, he was doing things with plastic bags because that was what he had access to. But, you know, you'd walk up and you introduce yourself and he would sort of move around and start telling stories that were probably not unlike Castle's relationship to his mother. He had this own kind of sign language that he had developed that was highly specific between the two of them. But he would always reach out with what he was making and you would touch it and then, you know, he, he would see touch anything. it. What's that? You couldn't see anything. Couldn't see anything and never seen anything. Oh. And, and, and you know, you would, you would touch it, he would touch it, and then you know, you'd pat him on the shoulder and he would kind of, you know, be elated and, and sort of walk off. And, um, and the first question in seeing his work at, at art shows and different things that he participated in was, well, does he really, does he really know he's making art? Mm -hmm. And my answer was like, well, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, of course he does. And, and I, I think that's sort of a universal thing. And, and uh, I think the question of whether or not, you know, Castle considered himself an artist or behaved like an artist. I mean, of course he's doing these little shows and things for his own edification, but uh, I just sort of think that's a, that's a, that's a human thing. I, I remember being told a story about Thornton Dial that you, you may have heard as well, that uh, he was, as, as, he, as you know, he used anything he yeah, could get it, sure. his hands on. And there was a, uh, he was sweeping up things from the studio floor and got interested in what that looked like. And uh, apparently uh, one of his sons said, looks like art. And Dial said, it's art. <laughs> <laughs> he made a whole series of those. Yeah, he just started pouring glue on canvas and then, yeah. you know, there you go. Mr. Dial was funny. He had a he had a story he would tell about uh, what we would tell later. But there was a journalist from a big New York publication that came down and interviewed him, and they said, well, "What do you think about being called a folk artist?" And he said, "Well, you know, all artists is folks." <laughs> and, and then the guy kind of looked, and then kind of looked at me, and I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> makes can't, sense." Can't so argue with sort of, that. Yeah. Can't argue with that. Um, well, the people are starting to come up, and. Um, they have their own kinds of mysteries. I mean, that's about as naturalistic as they ever get. Um. Because a lot of times you get book heads and chair yeah. heads and TV yeah. heads and all the surreal kind of um, juxtaposition of animal or inanimate things onto mm -hmm. human bodies, which, where that come from? I always assumed they were just sort of coming out of the buildings or out of the architectural environment. And mm -hmm. I also assume maybe, I mean, I guess by all accounts he was quite gregarious and liked watching TV, whether it be Red Skelton or and he read the funny papers and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm assuming his relationship to people was, was a bit funky, <laughs> you know? And, and I could, you know, hmm. I like the idea that he's at once very interested and not interested at all in these very blocky kind of things that are all around him. And that, 
he doesn't have any real means to communicate with. You mean with. because the constructions look so flat and unreal? Yeah. And the, the people constructions. Yeah, sort of like if you're not interested in people, maybe they would all just be like walking chairs and they would mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. blockheads. And well, apart from moving, they're really not communicating anything else. Huh. Um, this that, is that's another the installation that's with the a installation. special little theater box um, in my, the middle of it. I mean, my own armchair psychoanalytic reading of it is that he loved things, and and that in some ways there's this equivalence between people and things that doesn't denigrate one or raise one about the other. It's just this is the world. Things and people are a part of it. Animals are a part of it. Newspapers are a part of it. And I mean, in some ways, that equivalence is what I've really always kind of loved about about the work. That sounds really. Smart. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't ask him here only because he's good looking. <laughs> um, I, I, was, uh, I was told something very interesting um, that uh, there is someone who is uh, very knowledgeable about uh, hearing impaired people who's working on Castle and who said that uh, its attention to detail is uh, very characteristic because if you're, if you're navigating the world visually, uh, of course you're going to pay attention to mm -hmm. all of yeah. these patterns mm -hmm. and things in the corners because that's, that's your main source of information. And that's loving things yeah. also, as you say. Yeah. But, you know, constructions, people, <laughs> and they've got books in front of them? Or not? <laughs> yeah. We've, we have to take votes on these. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any of the uh, uh, constructions in the exhibition because our space is so small. We realized that if we were going to display them per, uh, properly, uh, the whole room would look like a forest. <laughs> but um, these two-sided things are so extraordinary. The, the three jackets that are hanging up are actually two-sided. If, it's extraordinary. Yeah. And some of them, you know, some of them have those little smart Norf Norfolk jacket um, yeah. belts in the back. <laughs> yeah. Do you get a sense that he m manipulated them to make that effect, or was he playing with things that he found that looked like something else that he then, you know, was it, was it the discovering of a piece of paper that let him do something, or was it the mm -hmm. making of the paper into I think he was interested in the structure of clothes. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know whether they they probably made their own clothes. Yeah. And that little back belt thing, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, kind of, um, that's not a very dressy <laughs> example. <laughs> no, but it's got, <laughs> it's got pretty fancy texture, and, and the head was pretty strange, yeah, the too. The bicycle head is just yeah. a sublime yeah. example of the surreal juxtaposition or, of odd elements. Or what about they, this worship at the temple here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is Turns that? out he was this closet mason or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. remember seeing anything looking like that. Yeah. Well, that, that, from, that came from the There are a lot of things in the show that, that, that are new. To well, they're probably still person. opening bundles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Um, we're, we're talking about Castle specifically. I have images of other um, self-taught artists here, and at least I hope. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, Philip, with your experience of so many uh, self-taught artists, particularly for the rural South, do you see a kind of commonality, or does, does uh, Castle set apart, or how do you see it? Well, I mean, you know, Castle is, is endlessly inventive, and I think that you know uh, a lot of the artists that I that I've worked with certainly they have a marked evolution, mm -hmm. but that marked evolution maybe isn't so quick, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, then you we start falling into these weird things that humans like to do, uh, particularly in the museum field, which is like creating those categories that we can kind of put people in so we can talk about them, and ultimately that's very useful for in both in both spheres, but. Um, 
you know, the things I've always been interested in just sort of happen to be made by self-taught artists. Uh, you know, again, coming to this not really knowing anything about art as a, as a kid and, and seeing someone who was in his garden being endlessly sort of inventive and using any kind of material he could find to any end and making songs and, and you know, really doing amazing things, Howard Finster. But, um, but I, just, I just really have always been drawn to artists that are making work in a direct response uh, to life, to the things that are around them, to the context of the people, to the, and, and, and you know, of course, artists that are generally classified in these, in these categories, like self-taught, like outsider, like, mm -hmm. of course, those are not generally responding uh, specifically to the, to the art world. Now they are somewhat, I think there's this sort of misconception that they're, that they're not. I don't know if it's 80-20 or 90-10 or 70-30, you know, it depends on who and when and how, but, but of course, everyone from Henry Darger to James, I mean, th there's some sort of relationship to the, to the art world, whether it be, you know, mass marketing, things arriving uh, in Idaho <coughs> via the post, or it be, uh, you know, things at the Art Institute of Chicago on the wall or Japanese prints that people may have seen, but... Um, well, you've worked so much with Souls Gone Deep and they are so full of messages. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you that's know, a whole yeah. different than, you yeah. know, I mean, that's a African American, you know, vernacular art of the yeah. South after the death of King and this whole flowering of creativity and pro. I mean, that's. Well, that, that's why we were able to do the show for yeah. the civil rights movement because these were very, very specific. Yeah, yeah, it's that a very specific. Made with those messages. But, uh, so, and the, and the more the more time uh, you spend looking at this, the more complicated it gets. Sure. Because right? it's it's all individuals and uh, very different backgrounds and very different responses. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Well, I was like I was rereading the Philadelphia um, catalog the other day. Uh, I guess two days ago. I told Anne she said she wished she'd done the same thing, <laughs> but uh, since she wrote it, I assume she okay. more more or less knows what, what it was about. But um, you know, there there was a lot of talk among the different essayists about you know where to put it and how to mm -hmm. put it and who should put it where and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, um, you know, that that's something I wanted to sort of ask ask you guys about because that's more your job in a way than mine. Uh, being a director of a commercial gallery, I mean, we certainly deal with museums, but we don't have the responsibility later of actually hanging them with whatever. But I mean, um, I know you've done that right now, obviously, and I've seen it at the Whitney, but how do you generally think about think about these things? You mean, uh, so I mean, general, well, Castle, Castle, and then, and then more generally. We've been you know. doing that for years. But, I mean, because we, we somehow, once we started getting outside our art, because our collections are so funky and weird, yeah. um, we got, um, I mean, major, but <laughs> weird. <laughs> so we got interested in um, not separating outsider from mainstream mm -hmm. once we started collecting it and then integrating the two as whenever we could or as mm -hmm. best we could. Well, I don't know you've done some still. pretty uh, terrific installations of, of just going, cutting a cross-section through your whole collection. And yeah, and now Lynn Cook has done a really historical mm -hmm. um, kind of bonanza of that um, subject at the National Gallery, which is uh, pointing out when certain eras were, were doing it big time, mm -hmm. the 20s, 30s, the 60s. Um, it seemed to me that, that the clearest part of that show was, was the earliest part. I think so, yeah. Um, where the sort of discovery or, or the accept, modernism's acceptance of non -cano Western canonical art be, became a really big deal. Um, what, what did you guys think? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I have really complicated views on that show. I mean, I went to see it and went to the symposium. Mm -hmm. And, um, Excuse me, what show are you talking Oh, Out, Outliers at the National Gallery? Yeah, and so it just opened a few weeks ago. It's um, American Modernism and, and the, uh, Self-Taught Artists, yeah. something yeah. like that. There's a little bit of parallel visions and that whole mentality in the show, mm -hmm. which I find to be, that's what I was asking. I tend to mm -hmm. find a little bit problematic when it's like, oh, this kind of looks like this as opposed to they were responding to the same set of conditions. So mm -hmm. like, you know, for example, you could, I don't know, someone like, you know, 
a lot of mid-century pop artists, for example, you could put with Castle mm -hmm. in a very plain way because of what they were responding to. But, uh, but then in a way, that sort of doesn't make sense. So I'm just wondering how you, how you guys think about it. Well, I haven't seen the show, but I think in terms of how we've been thinking about it with the collection at the Whitney, it's a collection that's 20th and 21st century art. Um, we don't have different departments, so it's one collection. Sure. So the, you know, a, a drawing by Castle is in the Whitney's collection, not in the drawing collection at the Whitney. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing, and it gets back to something that you were talking about earlier, is this question of intentionality. Sure. And I think um, intentionality for me is not as helpful when thinking about how these works will live next to people like Sheeler or Hopper. I think it's providing a context for people to look at the work, come at it with some information where they can assess where the artist is coming from, but then really have their own set of criteria that they come to the work. For me, this is why like the outsider thing doesn't isn't yeah. helpful. But I, I do think I wouldn't want to throw out certain labels like that because I think, and you know this better than probably any of us on this panel, that frequently it's been a term used to group together artists of color, people who are disabled or differently abled, um, issues of class, that I think it's not helpful when looking at it, perhaps totally aesthetically, but in terms of thinking about the conditions in which art is made, I think it's very helpful to think about. Sure. Um, Do you all think that surveys of American art or any art anywhere will ever include the non-mainstream in the survey? Well, uh, it's I mean, interesting it's because, you know, if you're, talk, if you're talking about a survey of French modernist art, Henri Gousseau is going to be in right. there. Yeah, yeah. Not, no special category. But I was thinking of, I guess, of no, American No, you were saying ones. American, and I'm, say, I'm um, trying to, you know, find an, a, a parallel. I only really know one book. It came out of California. I can't remember the name of it. That actually includes non-mainstream people and I think they might be in a little separate section rather than integrated because they don't really usually have an influence so much mm -hmm. and so they don't become part of the whole history thing mm -hmm. and so they don't get in the um, they don't get in the surveys. Well, they also don't go to the parties and they don't meet the curators yeah. and they're not you know, <laughs> yeah. at openings. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's really hard to hang out with the Whitney curator, you know, if you're deaf and in Idaho or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm just kidding. So, but, 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 it's not, but it's true, you know, it's like, you know, we're Thornton putting Dial, the responsible, like, <laughs> responsibility on you to get out there. You know, so I mean, and so Thornton Dial and Howard Finster, and now Finster was different because he could kind of go and he would mm -hmm. go on the Johnny Carson show and do his thing. And that's why he was probably successful mm -hmm. at, at that time because he could kind of do those things. Oh, that's familiar. But I do, I, I think that what's interesting about <clears throat> Lynn's show, Lynn Cook's show at the National Gallery, and I haven't seen it, but I worked with her on a planning um, colloquium she did years ago, is that she was really looking at the, the real influence that, that the outsider self taught artist had on artists that she was, that she knew, that, had, mm -hmm. that she had worked with already. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where the, the particular play at the Whitney Museum, the, you know, what we like to think of as the artist museum. If this is interesting to artists that are part of the thinking, maybe we can redirect, you know, ideas of influence, idea of who precedes whom, so that it does enter into art history in a different way. That it becomes an artist art history. I, I guess what I'm interested in is so you know when you go. I was at this symposium and I learned a lot uh, from a lot of different people. And one thing I really learned was that you know in the '70s. In the 80s, whether it be the New Museum or the Whitney Museum, there were a lot of solo shows given to these non-mainstream self-taught mm -hmm. artists, whether it be Howard Finster at the New Museum, whether it be Minnie Evans at the Whitney. Uh, and, you know, we don't really do that so much. The Philadelphia Museum, of course, may be a, re a recent e exception. Um, but, I mean, you know, I don't know when the last time the, these museums are doing these kinds of things in, in, in that way. Well, of course, I mean, every now, in the very at the Brooklyn, of course, they're, they're yeah. examples, but I don't think necessarily no, in the proportion mm -hmm. to to their influence. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go back, I'm also just pushing a little bit. If but. you go back, if you go back to the early days of the Museum of Modern Art, well, of course, uh, I mean that was part of their program. But it was sort of like and this, uh, Societe yeah. Anonyme as well, yeah. and it really, it really was a question of individuals being 
presented. And um, Edmondson, Edmondson was the mom. first African American, the first self-taught artist to show at MoMA. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the uh, things that uh, is maintained in the or, or asserted in the show in Washington is that uh, the presence of other artists making work that looked like Edmondson's made it more acceptable. Right. And of course, the, the part of what's interesting about that is the artists whose work looked like Edmondson's didn't know anything about Edmondson or self-taught right. artists of the rural South. They were looking at African art. They were looking at archaic art of different kinds. Uh, but she puts them side by side, and, which is a little bit of it looks like this looks kind good. of thing. But in the early in those in that early part of the show, it's very clear that the artists were leading the way. Nottleman, the Nottlemans were collecting it. Sure. Uh, they were establishing their museum. So it's exactly what what you're talking about. I think that's probably been the case for a very long time and mm -hmm. continues to be the case. Yeah. As somebody who you know deals with primarily self-taught artists, I mean, we, I I sell to a lot of artists. Uh -huh. yeah. You know. Not that they make work that necessarily looks like those things, but, you know. It speaks to them. Yeah, it speaks to them, and sometimes they take a cue here or there. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should open this up to some questions. <laughs>